Algatas Academy is back for season four of Dragonflight M+, and this guide offers a concise refresher on three things. Number one, it compiles all the tech and tricks still usable in season four, and if Blizzard fixes any of these in the future, I will note in the pinned comments. For better clarity, I will reuse relevant footage from my previous one minute M+ tips video. Secondly, I will recap the most dangerous mobs and boss mechanics of the dungeon that can break your keys, as well as tips on how to handle them. This is based off running this dungeon countless times in Season 1 of Dragonflight as well as on the PTR. And thirdly, any big changes or rework to abilities from Season 1 will be highlighted as well. Everything is timestamped. This video is meant to be a refresher, not the usual in-depth masterclass guide you see on my channel for M+. The masterclass guide for Elgathas Academy you see on screen, however, remains 99% relevant as Blizzard has made mainly minor adjustments to abilities. And so if you are a returning player, you are entirely new to Elgatas Academy The Dungeon, I recommend pausing this video, go and watch the masterclass guide first, link is in the description, before you dive into the more advanced tech and tips for season 4 covered in this video. Now with that said, let's dive into the tech and tips that still work for season 4. Now this trick actually comes from the MDIs, where everyone popularized the idea of snaps in Elgatas Academy onto the sentry. And keep your eyes peeled on the left side of this video, you would see as everyone jumps over to the portal, mandatory would initially just pull the sentry mini boss on the platform. It's always inefficient to work on a singular mob in Mythic Plus by itself, because why do that when you can cleave or AoE down that mob alongside other trash count? So what mandatory did here is before everyone leapt over, and I'll rewind the footage, just take note of the bottom right screen over here. You will notice this misdirect animation going off. That's from the Hunter RXH onto Skylark. Now, once everyone proceeds to jump over to pull the sentry, the hunter would then essentially, you know, pull the rest of the mobs and everything would then snap onto the rest of the party. As you can see right here, the mobs just snapped onto the sentry. And now the entire team can essentially come over and just plow through the big sentry mini boss, working on the mini boss while also cleaving onto the other ads, giving them really, really efficient count because of AOE rather than doing just a single mob. And throughout all the MDIs for Elgothas Academy, we saw various snaps. You can do it with a rogue as well, where you tricks the tank, everyone goes over to the other platform, the rogue then hits all the ads, and then you vanish so that you can get out of combat to take the wind over to the other platform. Same thing as Hunter, get out of combat, feign death, ride the current over to the other platform to join your team. You can also do something very fancy that Legendary did. I believe they pulled or rather they snapped mobs onto the sentry using a warlock pet. So some fancy shenanigans there as well. Now take note, when you do snapping in Elgatas Academy, the tank needs to be very alert to pick up aggro ASAP because their aggro seems to be a bit wonky when they first snap. And if you're in melee range, you might get clobbered before the tank actually gets aggro. So take note of that. In this next trick, I want to talk about how to properly pull all the trash in the Overgrown Ancients room. If you start the key and you start running all the way to the stairs, by the time you get to the top of the stairs, the skitterflies will just very nicely pad in front of you. And over this period of time, at this specific moment, a lot of beginner tanks would then pull the skitterflies first, then go around rounding up everything else in the room, including these lashes on the left, lashes on the right, and the skitterflies to the very end. And the problem with this is, it's actually the wrong sequence to pull things, because the skitterflies, the longer they are in combat, they actually gain a stacking buff that you will see in a bit. And let me just round up all these ads here, right? And actually, I'm not in Mythic Plus mode. This is just, you know, just a normal dungeon. So, um, you know, the, the mobs won't exactly kill me without a healer. But you can see the moment I engage the skitterflies here, right? What happens is the skitterflies will start gaining a stacking buff. You see this raging buff on their unit frames? And let me pop a defensive here. See this agitation buff? They will keep gaining stacks here that makes them stronger and stronger. And the problem is, if you pull the skitterflies early, you let them get additional stacks off before you round up the rest of the mobs. So what the right way to do this pack is, you want to let the skitterflies pet over the entrance first. Then you run in and you round up all the other mobs. Then pull the skitterflies last. Now one thing to mention about the skitterflies also, you don't need to do both packs of skitterflies. Now, at the start of season one, everyone was doing two packs of skitterflies just to be safe, but eventually everyone figured out that, hey, I actually don't need to pull uh, both packs. I just do one pack. And that's really because the patrol of the skitterflies, the other pack that tends to patrol further behind, they do not actually patrol all the way to the front. So what you can do is you can clear out all these trash, the lashes, and then 
what you will do is you will then pull the overgrown ancient boss once it becomes active all the way to the front of the entrance here, over here. Roughly here, it's fine. And it makes sure that the skitterfly that patrols behind would never aggro you while you're doing the boss. So it's just a little min-max thing that is going to help you immensely on fortified weeks because this pull on high keys is pretty terrifying. And if you are able to not engage the skitterflies early, do the lashes, group them up first, then pull the skitterflies, it's just way more optimal because there's less damage output on your group because the skitterflies will have been minimized in terms of their agitation stacks. The next trick here basically abuses line of sight to cancel the arcane ravagers vicious ambush and you can see that the ravager here is channeling vicious ambush on the resto druid and if it successfully channels this it would jump out of the pack that you're basically doing dps on and do a breath frontal you can actually use line of sight to cancel this jump and you can maximize your aoe damage on the pack and my healer here he's always baiting the jumps by trying to be the furthest away from the pack while everyone stacks in uh, in melee range. So you can use all these like little fire pits over here as ways to line outside. You can see him literally sneaking to the corner. Sorry about the jitters here. He can see over my cursor here, he was basically hiding behind the corner of the lamp. And what happens is the boss will cancel his vicious ambush and he will literally do a frontal on the tank. So the benefit of this is that as a tank number one, you can position the frontal such that the DPS doesn't have to move at all. Everyone can continue to cleave the mobs with the Ravager in place. It doesn't jump anymore. And that will basically save you a lot of uptime to AoE. So just to give you guys a better angle here, these two little squares here can be used to line of sight if you stand here in the corner. So what the tank needs to do is simply tank the Ravager in the middle of the two little fire pits here. And your range or your healer, the furthest away can always bait them and make sure they're line of sight. It's as simple as that. The vicious ambush can also be cheesed by stuff like shadow meld. You can see that my healer literally interrupted the cast by shadow melding. Or you can also feign death or going in this, I believe all works when you're being targeted by the ambush by the Ravager. The next tip is more of a visual hack. So if you sum up all the deaths in Elgatar's Academy, I can bet with you the biggest cause of death is dying to swirlies in this dungeon. You can see the detonation seeds from the lashes going out here. And you can notice that, wait, the contrast on my screen is really, really good. I can see the green swirlies very well in the dark. How is that possible? Similarly, when I do the ancient boss, I am able to see the brown swirlies really clearly. And that also goes for when I do Croft the boss, I can see the orange swirlies really well. And what's the trick? How do I get this high contrast vibe that you see on the screen over here? Things are kind of dark, and that's really because I'm using the inky black potion that you can see as of this buff here to the top right. Now, naturally for the rest of the dungeon, you can click off the buff so things look normal again, but I will recommend using it again for the bird boss. So let me demo to you how it works. Right now, you can see me clicking on my black inky potion and the screen fades to black and suddenly you can see all those orange swirly so clearly, so clearly. And now let's swap to talk about the possible areas where you will break your key and all the important changes you need to be aware of. And for this segment, I will be using footage from a friend of the show, Hopeful from Echo, because the range POV is just better at showing certain mechanics. So the first important one I want to talk about is the Scepter mob. Now there's two things we need to cover for Season 4 regarding the Scepter mob, and it's very specific to this mob I know. First, it has the potential to wipe your key. What you need to know is that the Scepter will do something called Mystic Blast. And Mystic Blast in Season 1 was an interruptible cast. It must be interrupted, else heavy party-wide damage. As I play the footage here, you can see that the Scepter is casting actually Mystic Blast at this moment. And you can tell by the M at the start of the cast. However, it's no longer interruptible. The only way to stop this Mystic Blast cast in Season 4 is to use a crowd control. And this is an important change you need to note from Season 1 to Season 4. And that is why Hopeful Search Group use various types of CCs. They chained and they disoriented. And that's how you stop the Mystic Blast ability. Now to compensate for that, Blizzard has made the second change that you need to know about regarding Scepters. And that is they no longer do Arcane Reigns. Arcane Rain used to be this ability where they spawn swirlies on the ground that one shot on high keys. So you need to take note that your crowd control can just be saved for solely Mystic Blast. Now, if you download my Season 4 Plater profile, the Scepter comes with a voice alert that tells you to CC when it's starting to do Mystic Blast. So that's something that could potentially help you. And while we're on this pack, let's talk about the other possible way that could wipe your key. This pool is pretty common on high keys and you have two battle axes, you see. The battle axes do something called a severing slash and they target the tank, which is the Avengers Demon Hunter Yoda here. Take note that the severing slash stacks and 
on a high fortified key, if you have two stacks of the bleed, it absolutely demolishes your health bar. So if possible, try and stop the severing slash being applied to your tank. This battle axis can also be found when you're crossing the bridge over from the entrance of the dungeon to the left side of where you want to do Vaximus. So just take note of this. This thing could absolutely destroy your entire run. If you don't play a tank, you probably won't know about this mechanic. Now let's talk to my POV and we talk about Croft and you can see Croft when he does this pack, it does so much damage to my health bar. And I mean like defensive stuns and whatnot, right? You can see this pack absolutely demolishes, especially on tyrannical keys, you're playing warrior. In fact, most tanks, they will struggle with the bleed because there's no real way to kind of block, parry a bleed. So it kind of trucks, make sure you have some defensives running for a pack on high keys. But the reason why I want to cover Croft specifically is it became one of the more difficult bosses to do after they nerfed the ancient tree boss. This became the breaker of keys on tyrannical weeks because of this mechanic, deafening screech. So you can see that to the right over here where my mouse cursor is circling, there is a debuff for deafening screech, right? We have two stacks and you can see my party all have two stacks. And this is the main mechanic that makes this fight difficult. So let's play uh, the footage here a little. You can see that when the boss casts deafening screech number three, it basically does more damage to us. You can see almost, um, you know, it does a lot of damage. The monk almost dies. So the reason is because deafening screech is a debuff that stacks. And the next application of deafening screech does even more damage based on the current stacks you have. And you might ask, wait, then how do you drop your stacks? Because you know, you're gonna die. The way you drop the stacks is you send three different balls into the goals over here. You can see from this indicator at the top and that will basically reset the stacks on Deafening Screech. So why don't you use it way earlier? Why don't we reset it way earlier by sending three balls on the ground directly into the goalpost? Because the moment you do that, you have to deal with additional mechanics in the fight. So most people try and prolong the reset time to later in the fight. And we actually go for four stacks here, which is you know pretty scary in a park, but in an organized group, it's actually worth doing. So you can see that Deafening Screech is gonna come out and uh, by the way, another Savage Pack and I'm using like defensive and trinkets and stuff. That thing trucks, just make sure you have something on. Uh, but you can see Deafening Screech is about to happen, the fourth one, right? After this uh, frontal gust. And this one, we pop like our big cooldowns, like including Aura Mastery and whatnot. You can see Aura Mastery is running, personal defensives are running. We take the fourth stack, we survive that. And then at the very last possible second, we would basically reset our stacks by throwing um, the ball into the goalpost. So I'm inching closer just before Deafening Screech number five, where I know we absolutely cannot survive. I send the ball into the goalpost and that basically resets our stack. You can see Firestorm procs and the debuff is gone, clears our stacks. And at this point in time, naturally, um, you should go all out on... And by the way, I timed it such that it interrupts the Savage Pack with a stun, which is perfect. And there's a damage amp at this phase where you should pump damage into the boss. So my advice is before you start the key, talk about how you want to do Croth. Do you do three stacks? Do you do four stacks? Who should send the balls into the goalpost to reset the stacks? And tanks, just make sure you have defensives running for pack. Swapping real quick, hopeful says POV. I just want to quickly point out some of the changes in the boss from season one to season four. As you can see, they reset their stacks here. They send the balls in, stun the boss. But in this second phase, Firestorm, you notice that has a smaller AOE, slightly smaller AOE in season four. So easier to dodge. Now, the other big thing is the tornadoes that spawn in this fight now. So you can see that the tornadoes are way more visible, right? And also the other thing that I see people not do and what Hopeful is trying to do here is that you would see these shiny circular orbs that spawn when the tornadoes are active. A lot of people just ignore them, but you should actually pick it up because it stops you from being pushed back. You can see he's being pushed back here, right? The moment he picks up the orb, he can just stand still and cast. So it's help. It's gonna help you like dodge mechanics way better when you're not being constantly pushed back. So it's something that I notice a lot of people don't do uh, because they don't know what the orbs actually you know work or how they actually uh, function. By the way, picking up those orbs also gives you a haste buff. So DPS players, you should be incentivized to go get them. The next trick is about Vaximus. So Vaximus has this thing where there's a nasty overlap sometimes. You can see its mana bomb is going out. And right as the mana bomb is about to expire, you can see one second, it does arcane fissure. Now mana bombs have been nerfed for season four and I suspect it's for this overlap. So there's two instances of damage and it will instantly knock out every single one. As you guys can see, the first instance of damage goes out from mana bombs, followed by fissures, everyone dies on a 22 tyrannical. So as you start doing higher tyrannical keys, this overlap is super deadly. But before we talk about the solutions, let's talk about why that one hit combo happens. Why does that very nasty overlap happen? So. Vexamus actually casts mana bombs on the party at a fixed timer, right? So it's on a timer that is set the moment you pull the boss. 
However, fissure is determined by the amount of energy that Veximus has. So the play here is actually to use the mana orbs that are spawning here to desync the boss. And what do I mean? Because when you let one mana orb through to the boss, the one that's flying over here that my healer is about to soak, when you let one orb through to hit the boss, the boss actually gains energy. And if you are one of those parks, which is, by the way, very normal, that soaks every single orb, this overlap is very, very likely to happen because the boss will gain energy at a fixed rate. And there'll be a moment in time where he gains enough energy where fissure happens at the same time that mana bombs go out. You can see that mana bombs has gone out on everyone, right? You can see it from this like faint circle and this faint circle over here. Mana bombs have gone out. You need to manually eyeball when arcane fissure will happen. So according to Big Wigs, I know that it will happen in a couple of seconds when mana bomb happens. So if you guys can see, mana bomb and fissure literally are just like five seconds apart, right? And remember, mana bomb kind of like you know, ticks down in three seconds. So when Mana Bomb goes out, you can see Veximus casting Mana Bombs. I quickly eyeball Big Wig's timer and it says five seconds. So I know that this is the nasty overlap and this is when you ask people to pop personals or as a tank, like, you know, if you're a warrior, I basically pop Rally over here. And what you can see right now is the Druid also pop Buckskin and shortly the Hunter Turtle, right? And the Priest Shooter themselves, everyone pop big defensives and basically you survive. Swapping back to my POV, now this boss was an absolute terror. This ancient boss was a terror in week one, week two of like season one release. And the reason is a couple of reasons. Um, but let me talk about the important parts that you need to know. Firstly, for the germinate ability, you always want to stack. Stack tight, move together, and that way you spawn these lashes you know, tight together. And the reason is because a lot of people made this mistake in season one, where the lashes spawn and everyone just like, oh my God, time to pad. And you pop all your defensive cooldowns, so you want to look good on the meters. But that is like the worst thing to do because the lashes here should be cleaved down passively. The tank should bring the boss onto all these lashes and you just cleave passively. That's all you do. You don't do anything special. Just cleave them down passively. The reason is because you want to save damage for this phase. It does branch out. It spawns this at this branch that needs to be kicked because if it doesn't, then it heals. So once you kick it, you want to try and burst down the ad ASAP. Why? Because... Throughout this entire phase, the boss is basically placing a dot across the entire party. And this dot kind of trucks. The only way to get rid of this dot is to kill the ad, and the ad will then spawn this healing circle. You can see this circle over here. A lot of people thought in season one that, oh shit, this looks like bad AoE, let's get out of it. But actually you need to stay within it to cleanse your debuff. You can see once the healing circle goes off, all of our debuffs are now gone. So that's very important. Save damage for the big ad, and then you just passively cleave down this end. So don't fall into the trap of using DPS cooldowns on these things. And you see this burst fourth ability, you want to make sure you save some for defensive cooldowns or high keys, it kind of trucks. The last thing about this fight, why it's dangerous is because these slashes, they melee the tank. Every time they melee the tank, they place a poison stack on the tank. If you get something like 30 stacks, 40 stacks, your tank is in serious danger. So two things you can do. Firstly, if you have a poison dispel, dispel the tank. If not, you want to try and help out your tank here with like Ring of Peace, stuns and whatnot. So the tank can get away and drop the debuff because it's like a nine second dot, right? So if they don't get hit for the next nine seconds, they are able to drop the debuff. So stunning the ads and whatnot does help. You can see I shockwave the ads. Any form of CC definitely helps with just slowing down the application of the stacks. The other thing to talk about is this sentry mob. So I earlier talked about this MDI thing where you can snap mobs onto this thing. Now talking from a tank POV, this thing absolutely slaps. It really trucks. This storm slash on high keys for the fight, it trucks. I've ignored pain, I spell reflection running, and even though I have that and these stuns, it basically take 60% of my health bar. So just be very careful and the daily wins actually do one shot. Um, the other thing you need to know about this ability is, or this mob is it does this AOE, this storm slash coming in again, you can see um, it really trucks, it kind of hurts. So make sure you have something running. Um, the other thing that you need to take note of is that you can actually just line outside this expel intruders. Um, you can just stand behind a pillar and you can be in the AOE and you're completely fine. So just take note of that. It's just a min-max thing. Okay, the other thing I like to cover is these mobs at the end, the Echo Knights. And I just want you to see um, how we are doing the Echo Knights here. We've basically positioned the Echo Knights all the way on the stairs and there's a reason for that. So these Echo Knights, they do something called Astro Whirlwind where they spin on the spot and it does AOE damage to people who come near them, melee range. However, there's a kind of like an exploit or a little hack. It's got to do with the graphical engine of World of Warcraft. There's something called a Z-axis. And a Z-axis basically controls the altitude of the unit. So in this case, they are spinning on this particular height on the stairs. 
Notice what my monk is doing. So this monk is standing below me a couple of yards and he's hitting the mobs upwards. Now the great part about this is that because he's standing at a different altitude versus the mobs, he doesn't get hit by Astral Whirlwind damage. However, he's still in range to use his melee abilities because melee abilities are calculated by X and Y axis, which is your position on the map, just in a 2D sense. Now if this made no sense to you, just know that if you stand below the mobs and you hit them from a below position to an upwards position, you do not get hit by Astro Whirlwind's damage. Just notice his health bar over here. He doesn't take any damage. I can rewind a little here. Just notice his health bar over here, right? Look at his health bar. His health bar doesn't move, even though they are doing Astro Whirlwind. Look at his position. He doesn't take damage. So it's a little min-max thing for melee DPS to kind of just pump damage into these mobs. The other thing that I'll say is the invokers need to be kicked. Firstly, they do two abilities. The first is Astro Bomb. You should let Astro Bomb go off. Don't interrupt Astro Bomb because you can see it's on my rogue now. Astro Bomb can be then placed onto the ads. You can see him running into the ads here because when the thing goes off, it actually friendly fire damages the Echo Knights and the Invokers. So you want to let the bomb go off. But what you want to kick is basically the uh, Arcane Missiles. That thing actually does hurt. See this Arcane Missile? This thing trucks. Although Blizzard nerfed it in Season 4, like damage-wise. It works exactly the same way, but you should try and kick this if possible because there's no other things you want to kick in this pack anyway. Now moving on to the final boss. Echo of Doragosa has a new mechanic and it's called Unleash Energy where it basically spawns on pool, where it basically spawns two swirlies, big swirlies on the ground that now acts as portals for um, ops to be fired off. It's a new ability, why? Because in Season 1, to spawn these portals that kind of fire ops at people, you can see the ops will start traveling from those arcane portals towards the group um, in a short while. You can see those ops, yep. Those ops, they're being fired from these portals that Doragosa spawns with his new ability. In season one, the only way to spawn these portals is you get the energy bomb debuff. The boss will place like an energy bomb debuff on you. You get three stack. Upon dropping your third stack, you will spawn this portal. You know, that allowed you to kind of control where you spawn all these portals. You could spawn them, you know, all clumped up and that way it makes it way easier to dodge all those bullet hell mechanics ops that's coming at you. However, in season 4, they added this ability, unleash energy that makes this fight way more difficult because it was kind of a walkover in the past, which is why you saw them pulling mobs to the boss. It's a walkover because the boss simply just did a frontal and as long as you don't get hit by frontal, you generally are okay. And as long as you dodge ops with common sense, you should be okay. So in this fight in season 4 now, you need to be more careful about where you place your third stack of debuff because that spawns the portal. So ideally, you want to spawn them all clumped up together. Space management has become way more important in Season 4 versus Season 1. Just take note of that. Now, while we're talking about Doragosa, there's a very nifty trick that we can do to the boss. You can see that when the boss does Energy Bomb, which is the Arcane Bomb thing I talked about, if you're playing a warrior, you can actually spell Reflect the Energy Bomb. And if you use my beta profile towards the end of the cast, you can actually see who the cast is going on. Another clue is where is the boss facing when it channels energy bomb. In this case, facing me, I pop spell reflection. Notice what happens. The spell reflection actually makes the energy bomb go off on the boss rather than me. Now, as a melee, just make sure you stand in melee max range and you should be fine. But the good news about this is that it prevents you from taking one stack of the debuff. Remember, three stacks spawns this gate where it fires off the orb. So this delays the bullet hell mechanic for your group. I think it's pretty massive. It's just a tiny trick. Something worth thinking about if you're playing a pro warrior or you're playing some form of DPS warrior. And that's pretty much everything you need to know for a refresher for season four in order to time the dungeon fortify and tyrannical. All the best and good luck. If you like more content, make sure to subscribe to this channel for season four and plus tips. Also, big thank you to all the Patreon subscribers that you see on screen. Thank you for making the content on this channel possible. You guys are the real MVP. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, link is in the description. Good luck and I'll see you in the next video. You might also want to check out the video in the middle of the screen that will help with your preparations for season four.